Disruptors and curious minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper, where we get to talk to the creators, the founders, the disruptors that are building the next version of the world that we will slowly but surely be immersed in over the next 5, 10, 15 years. My name is Jeremy. This is Mark. It's Hello. Thursday. It's 1030 Eastern. It's time to dig into some fun stuff, Mark. What's on your mind, dude? Um, I, I tired but happy. Uh, had a a late night watching England beat the Netherlands in the that semi-final. Was a big win. We're going to the final for American friends. This is football. Yes, yeah, Spain on Sunday, which is actually the Quatorze Juillet as well, the fourteenth of July, Bastille Day here in France. So we're celebrating, chopping heads off kings and queens, and <laughs> and then segue. It's the school holidays now. My kids are still too young to spend their summer holiday gaming, but it's not going to be very long until they do. So today's show is my preparation for what comes next for them, because I don't know about you, but my gaming career peaked on um, GoldenEye stack, license to kill four player on the N64. Ooh, all right, all right. And Correct me if I'm wrong, but things have moved on since those. A little days. bit, just a touch, just a touch. Yeah, I might be, I might be, I might be two steps ahead of you. My my kids have been in the world of you know Fortnite and Valorant and uh, Call of Duty and all of these, and I I pop in and just you know the language even that they speak. Now I'm not talking about like you know uh, fruity language. English. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about just like the the code words and the stuff they use. It's like. It's it's mind it's mind blowing. Uh, but I pop in and I, I get immersed that way. I don't play. I played. They convinced me to play Fortnite for an hour and I got my butt kicked. Like totally, it was an ego blow. I couldn't stay alive for more than like five seconds. So I'm like, all right, maybe I maybe I'm over my over you my. Go back, get back into it. Maybe Call of Duty is your game. Maybe you need the right game. Maybe so. Well, maybe our guests can can help us navigate yeah. that. But yeah, we're really looking forward to this. This is this is a lot of a lot of people give gaming a bad rap and say that you know oh, they just get into these games and their minds are melting and there's no human interaction and all of this stuff where game tree is doing something really interesting building community in these environments um digitally right so i mean that maybe there's meetups or, or something like that but i think it's really interesting to explore this side of the fence and and my my kids are my kids are going to listen to this episode and go dad i told you so right this stuff is yeah. great um but uh yeah without further ado but really quick uh sponsor message We've got a we've got a um, a new sponsor today, uh, and I want to talk to you about that really quickly. So uh, this show today is brought to you by the program Right to Know You. Right to Know You explores uh, the world around you and yourself using a very innovative process of journaling and sense making, and it's done in these five week cohorts. And actually, I'm the guy that uh, I'm the guy that leads them. So if you want to learn more about Right to Know You, check it out at righttoknowyou.com. Mark, let's intro our guest. Fire yes. away. So our guest today is Dana Sidorenko. Uh, she's a gaming entrepreneur, investor, Forbes 30 under 30. And for today's show, she's the founder of Game Tree, which is, well, I'm going to let her speak to it, but it's got a community of over 700,000 players. I think it's like a 20 million valuation. Sky's the limit. So welcome to the show, Dana. Hi, guys. Thank you very much for inviting, for having me. No, thank you. Thank you for waking up early as well, because I believe you're in California. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, it's a sunny day in San Francisco. Just kidding. There's no sunny days over here. <laughs> yeah, you got a little mist, Foggy. little fog. Yep, absolutely. Well, awesome. Well, let's, Mark, let's, like we like to thread these shows together, right? Let's, let's yes, start we with, uh, we had an amazing chat with, with Don Norman, who, um, you know, is, is a kind of a guru of just design and, and humanity centered design is kind of his new realm. And he helped me human centered design my lighting. So I think people can see me a little bit better now, hopefully. Uh, thank you, Don Norman, but, uh, Mark, go ahead and, uh, let's, let's hit the carryover question first. Yeah. So the question from last week was, and it's quite vague, but how is AI a positive for humanity? Ooh. And you can answer that via the prism of gaming however you like and then we'll First get all, i think very good question because he specified like positively for humanity yes. because it's like such a powerful tool that you very easily can abuse it and i can see especially from like gaming and in gaming um that a lot of company they use ai for for example create a new npc and create very realistic 
avatars, very realistic uh, characters inside the game. So, you know, they can have less script and more like open world with more NPC. I think it's actually very dangerous and it is kind of misused because it's create you illusion that, oh, I'm not by myself. There's other people kind of, but it's not real people. It's not real human connection. It's a, um, it's like you, you don't really build that, that thing, like that social layer that you look inside the game. Uh, but what about positive use? For example, I know quite some company and that's also something that we use when you use AI to create, to, uh, use, to work with the big data, for example, analyze user behavior, create better user experience, uh, from gaming perspective in gaming or in tech in general for humanity. I think it's amazing technology that hopefully will allow us to spend more time with people who we love. I'm not afraid that it's going to steal our jobs or something like that. Um, I might be slightly afraid that it's going to destroy humanity, but that's, that's not a net positive. <laughs> well, we got We got We got to hit it. We got to hit it from both sides. So I, I think about this a lot, Dana, what, what in your mind, and I've got my own answer that I'll share with you because I think about it a lot. Like I said, the, what what in your mind do humans do better than machines today? Right now is creativity. So if you will, pre yeah, we have Majority, we have Dali, we have a lot of tools to create something, but it's actually recreating from something that already exists. If you need to do, um, if it's a fast changing environment and you need to do a lot of like, uh, creative, like, you know, problem solving machines is still very much not there. And you have something that machine doesn't have. It's human experience. Machine has a lot of information, much more than we possibly can absorb during our life, but it still not replicates our emotions. It still not replicate, um, what human can give to each other. Uh, so I think when I think, when I talk about positivity from AI, imagine the world or you don't need to work five days per week, eight hours, or wherever. If you're in the U.S., it's more. <laughs> uh, imagine yeah, we don't world. work in Europe. <laughs> yeah, I heard that. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> uh, imagine if you can, you know, finish all your work for three hours, two hours per day, and then spend the rest of it enjoying your life, drinking wine on the on the coast, talking with your buddies like, you know, flying around. Now, I, I think by it's not necessarily bad to to have helper over there to be more productive. It's part of the progress in a way. Can I ask you a question? Because um, personally, as a writer, I've definitely lost some work because of AI. Like I can I can I can prove that. But Last year, I was actually writing some game law. I spent a lot of last year writing the game law for a, a new game, which unfortunately got canned right at the end. But every week when we were speaking with the coders and the design team, all of the the artwork was done by AI essentially. And like every week there was more AI content. And really like what I was doing was the only thing that wasn't or didn't seem to be done by AI. And I don't know how much experience you have of actually the design of games process, but are all the gaming companies using AI today and using it a lot? I think a lot of companies using AI doing the uh, creating games nowadays, but I'm pretty sure there would be some companies who will put it as a differentiation point. Like we haven't used AI, like our game is different because we haven't used AI, and then and it's going to be this like you know unique kind of maybe even retro style, but also AI in many way you can recognize it if you work enough with that if you use I don't know enough wherever, majority, GPT, wherever, you can see the patterns. You can actually see that this has been done by AI. And right now, a lot of search optimization, search engine, they don't like AI-generated content because it's like, it's in a way empty. There's a lot of words, but very, like few meanings. Yeah. Um, versus somebody who would, for example, describe his life experience and his life knowledge that some some human work like they full of meaning you can take like one page and from each sentence has created the whole book out of it but for ai it's going to be um uh, slightly different we in general we i feel like in in many ways we live in a period when there's a lot of things being generated 
especially with Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. It's just so, such a mass produce like fabrics, like mass produce uh, manufacturers. But uh, the quality of this and meaning of this kind of go down a lot. I think that's the big thing. We talk about this as a theme and, and you know, Kevin Kelly, who uh, Mark has reached out to Kevin Kelly's team to hopefully get him on the show at some point. He's got a couple of great books, but one of the one of the books uh, that I read about his technological trends to watch out for, I think it's nine or 12 trends or whatever it was. One was this idea. There's so much content even back then produced every day, right? More than more than we could sit down and watch the rest of our lives that was created in the last 24 hours so the idea of like filtering stuff and getting access to the right stuff because it's so easy to create that there's going to be a lot of junk and a lot of chaff that we have to kind of run through so i think you're spot on dana when you talked about the back end of what using ai for going through these data sets right these large data sets to try and kind of sense make the data that's a great application of it yeah, but this is kind of already what's going on. For example, you, uh, in algorithm of YouTube, algorithm of Instagram, they've been using AI for personal recommendation for a very long time. It just wasn't at that hype. It wasn't really called like AI because it's machine learning, um, but it doesn't have language models, which right something that we called AI right now, but it's a language model pretty much. Well, now AI is the, the nefarious robot that has been like uh, conjured in all of our minds when we think about it, you know, with the dark shroud and all it's our, it's the tech, like you said, the tech's been used for a really long time. Now it's yeah. just being applied very differently. Well, let's, let's move yeah, let's, on. Let's, yeah. move, let's take Don's question yep. out of this. So Jeremy has the upper hand here. He's ahead of the game and with me. So before we get into game tree, could you just give me a brief summary of the gaming ecosystem in 2024? The biggest games, the biggest platforms. Do people still use consoles? Is it all PC? Just like, a, <laughs> just so I can um, a, a bit up yeah. to date with the ecosystem. Okay, people do use console. That's uh, pretty good news uh, for those who like console. I think people uh, world get. Uh, over time, gaming get more differentiated between different platform and different publishers and different games, and is grow massive right now. There's like almost three billion people playing games. It changed also massively. It all almost all games move online right now. It's quite rare that oh, like you need a. Does anyone still buy games like on the on the CD? Nobody. Um, Streaming go really big, uh, so you can stream, you can not download games, but you can play them online. Um, even solo games, even if it's not MMO games, you can. You don't need to have space on your computer anymore. You don't need to even have a strong computer, a gaming computer. You can uh, outsource this power and just play and enjoy games and things like that. Uh, the biggest game, uh, well, if it's different for different generation, I think um, like Minecraft right now and also Roblox, people probably um, didn't expect it to see, but it's got really big one. Uh, some classic games is still around and still pretty much skyrocketed. You mentioned Fortnite is a great game, Overwatch, uh, Call of Duty. Um, this guy's still pretty big one and have massive audience. Um, games also get game as an industry, gaming industry right now. I would say struggling because um, during the COVID, everything was going up and a lot of money was deployed into games and a lot of company was started and people thought that it's going to be like this all the time, but then COVID and people go back to work and start playing less. So a lot of companies that was started during COVID, a lot of games that was started creating during COVID and game cycle has around three, four years. They kind of get to this point where they need more resources to finish the game, but not a lot of resources is available anymore because the hype is gone. Um, so gaming as an industry, suffering, gaming as entertainment, still over there, still growing, like around 12 to 16% year to year. A lot of people play games. Maybe if we say the most popular platform, it's going to be mobile. Not because mobile games is the best, but because it's the most um, easy to access platform. 
everybody has mobile. So in many countries that uh, haven't been adapted to gaming right now, start playing more, for example, Latin America, Brazil, even Africa, we can see that it's going up, people start playing more. And um, it's interesting new markets that entering the gaming world. Um, what did I miss? In terms of what popular, uh, what more popular, PC or Xbox, I will say it depends on the country where you are. Okay. So there's, uh, there's countries like Western world where um, traditionally PlayStation is more popular, but there's a lot of countries like Japan or Asia where, uh, or even some countries in Europe that Xbox is more popular. So it's not that simple. Well, okay. the mobile game, the mobile game thing too, you know, I, you remember the, the among us phenomenon and, you know, uh, stumble guys is kind of another one. I, I always see my kids like playing around and, and it's like these, these quick little, you know, quick little experiences. Yeah. One thing I wanted to hit on too, Dana, that you mentioned is kind of gaming as a, uh, as a as a new industry as a business with it that brands are thinking i remember when like the whole metaverse thing spun up spun up mm -hmm. the web three thing spun up and it was like hey everyone all these big brands they have to build a game you got to build a game and all the game people are like do you know how hard it is to build a game <laughs> like you guys under and there was this giant disconnect it was really funny to kind of experience and i think the brands w w finally got into it if they build a game they have to continue to refresh it and update the experience and all of that. And they're like, whoa, this oh, is yeah. going to cost millions, right? So well, they went into skins, didn't they? A lot of the luxury brands and the clothing brands were using skins in games. I think like League of Legends was a yeah. really popular one for that, wasn't it? Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of companies been creating around that and about uh, assets in gaming and brands asset. But something really cool that you mentioned, uh, it is a big trend. A lot of people try and a lot of people fail and they underestimate how um, how complicated gaming and creating game uh, process looks like. But then imagine that you have AI now, you have tools, you don't need to have that amazing idea. And that's what we I think we're going to see as a big trend. Games going to get in a way shittier and shittier. And they <laughs> and because like if it's done by somebody who you know don't have enough experience don't really think through it and just want to you know create it for sake of create it it's just going to be lacking of game design of complexity and things like that so imagine how it used to be i don't know like for having good photo you need to do photo shooting it used to be for having good video you need to have you know professional person doing this even for music you need to have somebody talented composer who would read it right now with ai you don't really need it the same with games and unfortunately that's probably something that coming it used to be pretty long pretty complicated process you need to have a lot of uh, thoughts a lot of like thinking process to create a good game i think now with ai we're going to see something like tiktok or instagram but for games where you can oh. just scroll and you know spend 15 second play some game that well, didn't really been thinking through sounds horrendous no i tell you what though there's this like there's this the short form content like the the tiktok barrage the social media barrage that has reduced the um the desire for humans to stay in situations longer than that particular time period so maybe maybe design maybe the trend is to create these micro experiences that in turn send you to the macro but hasn't gaming been one of those domains to Definitely. book that trend where people play games that last i don't know 70 80 100 120 hours to complete or games have become longer almost haven't they or the good ones yeah i think it's a, it's about action i think when you watching tv or something you kind of passively observe action uh, books it's even harder because like if you read books more than i know 15 minutes 30 minutes you're like oh it's boring what is what mean boring it's like nothing is going on you're not really like actively doing something versus game has really good advantage over here because there's a lot of action going on very often and you are actively doing something so they very engaging unlike other type of content where you usually just passively consume it 
I would just add that books aren't boring in the Thinking on Paper book club, by the way. <laughs> Reading is now a team sport. Thinking on paper.xyz. Check it out. Yeah. Um, Dana, let's let's move to um let's move to gaming communities and, and what you're doing with with game tree and and how this is the, how this is the goal is to establish kind of more meaningful connections between right. the people playing games not just a single game but various games talk to us about that a little bit um so a little bit uh story around here when uh i'm ex-military and when i get back from war i decided to jump into gaming again um was gamer since I was a kid and gaming always was your way of building meaningful relationship. Kids play with each other all the time. That's how we built our connection, our relationship, and it's a very natural uh, way. So I thought, oh, like I have problems with socializing. It's challenging for me to find new friends. Um, I'm going to play again. I'm going to build relationship through gaming. Uh, I'm going to meet my new friends in games. And that was the first moment when I realized how gaming changed with everything move online with like a bunch of people play it online. It's, uh, it's become a waste of time because these people don't have any interaction before game and don't have any interaction after game. So you have tons of randoms that throw only for one game session that don't know anything about each other and add to this pressure from the game. And then suddenly you're going to have super toxic environment. So I started experience toxicity. I started feeling even shittier than I felt before and I give up playing. And um, it's almost like too much choice. Too many people play games and it's so complicated to find the one who would be right for you that um of, often it's just a wrong people it's a wrong experience and you don't really enjoy the social layer anymore and big part of the games is a social games it's a social aspect it's a mmo games where you know um tons of people spend time with each other it's kind of like a third world in a way um i think you mentioned it before but um, it's still for many people, especially for young generation games, it's not about game, but it's like third space where you can spend time when you can hang out with your friends. And it's like kind of social media of new generation in a way. So, yeah. So let's, let's talk about a little aspect of that. So I, in, in, I had an experience early on in VR, like a long, long, I don't know, probably six or eight years ago. And there was a there was a space, a gathering space that you would go into. I can't remember what the platform was called, but I I jumped in there for the first time, and it was like an anonymous thing, right? Like, so you had an avatar, but you'd it wasn't like, oh, I know that's Mark or I know that's Dana. Yeah. It's like some random name that's popped up. And I think the way you act, at least, this is what I noticed in this early VR space, like because there was no identity accountability, like people mm, yeah. were jackasses, and like an, an, an anonymity. Yeah, does seem to do that. Anonymity seems to make you or make a lot of people. Yeah, assholes. especially if you're a gamer and uh, a lot of people around is like very social, awkward, unexperienced uh, teenager boys. It's like not fun, guys, not fun. That's why uh, there's a couple things. I guess that social responsibility should be a thing. You don't have to share your personal information, but you also should have responsibility, social responsibility. And that's something that we borrow from um, game theory when in, we've been studying how to create a better algorithm, how to match people, what could be solution for uh, solving toxicity, some solve loneliness online. Um, I jumped to this. Um, how do you familiar, familiar with like prisoner dilemma? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, the behavior of and your decision that you're going to make, collaborate or not collaborate, in many ways going to be uh, depend on is it going to be a single interaction or is it going to be a repeated interaction? If you know that I'm going to see this person next time, if you know we're going to see each other and, you know, we have a lot of 
friends in common and things like that, you suddenly has this like long-term vision of your relationship with this person. And that's something that also was very around in like tribal society when human was evolved. Uh, you know, we haven't been evolved living civilization in multi-million cities. We was evolved living small tribes, like 30 people, 50 people. That was the group that for our brain is comfortable to be around. Um, and then over time, it's like getting massive and we kind of don't really know. We lost. We don't know what to do in such a big group of people. We don't know how to behave. We don't have the social responsibilities. So we make a step back. And, you know, if you in the chat with like thousand people, you're probably not going to say anything. You don't know any of them. But if it's group from 15 people, you see people see you. You're not suddenly like, you know, just like... Uh, lost anymore but how to curate this 15 people it's not it shouldn't be like just randoms because it's not going to be positive experience some people and that's been research done first we noticed that then we started searching around asking around and riot games that similar experience uh, similar research when they found that about 80 percent of all toxicity it's not really uh, people trying to be shitty for each other it's very often miscommunication and clashes of personalities, values, and culture, and things like that. Yeah. Okay. So you you started building Game Tree because there wasn't you something for you, was missing for you, and so you built it yourself. Uh, right. So like I met my co-founder, and um, he shared with me his idea, and he has a different problem. Uh, when he finished college, he moved to another city. And, you know, he, as a gamer, didn't really know better than just sitting at home and playing games in, a, in his new city. And then he also found himself super depressed. And then, like, you just go work, home, and play games, and that's all your life. And gaming didn't really help you socialize anymore versus from your life experience, you expect that games is a social activity that games is going to help me to build friendship and things like that so we uh, he shared idea to create a platform that will curate groups and match you and help you to find community not just based on your sex age and gender but going to go much deeper going to see you for your values for your personality type and find you not just people who you can play with but your next uh, best friend and I really like it because I think friendship is very strong and powerful tool. And it's very hard to build friendship as an adult because we never have enough time because it's usually need to be some sort of third activity or third hobby or third interest that bring you both together to spend time with each other. And in this game, case, gaming is perfect because it's give you common purpose you already like if you can curate people who share similar values, who can um, create very strong bonds, um, then suddenly it's not just a platform where you can spend time, but it's super, super important. I believe that relationship is probably the most important or like after health, the second most important thing in human experience. Yeah. What? What is what? So, what does the intake process look like? So, say say Mark and I are independent gamers. We don't know each other, and we we jump into Game Tree. Like I jump into Game Tree. What what do you ask me, or what does Game Tree ask me to try to line me up with with like minds? Uh, so we start from very like you know simple things. We start from oh, what's your favorite games? What uh, what did you enjoy to play and then after like as you get deeper into onboarding process we start asking you a lot of questions about your values and your personality for example something it can be something super simple it can be you know like your feeling about lgbtq people you're feeling about um we kind of like hide this question but uh they are still around like what do you think about like, who's your fav favorite uh players and we give you like bunch of female options and to see like do you even aware of some female pro players or like what do you think about some female esport and things like that and then we also ask you um 
what other like sports do you play we find a big so there's there's been a big research done on a friendship and they took uh people who was lifelong friends and they asked them a bunch of questions and they try to find the correlation between a uh, question that they ask and um, how strong is the friendship and how long is the friendship and they find out that the biggest uh component to friendship is actually share the same values and when we talk about values it's it's everything it's um like we have model that's running with like more than 100 different data points on on each uh, person uh something super important for toxicity is as i mentioned your um your attitude to politics your attitude to um different type of people um so we measure we go pretty deep on on that personality wise we have a big model that we use like around 32 different types of people how we match with them with each other it's not necessarily just like extrovert or introvert it's more complicated it's more like somebody's driven by logic somebody's very chaotic and he will like kind of piss off people who are super organized some people super competitive and some very casual and they're gonna be they're gonna find each other pretty toxic because if you very casual gamers you'll be like oh it doesn't matter we're just gonna have fun we it's you know we are spending our time over here and if you very competitive gamers if you want to win you're going to be like oh dude you know try hard enough like we're going to lose because of you and that's just natural like you know feel for tox to toxicity and uh, for having negative experience and very often it's like no one is wrong it's just wrong people play together it's an align it's an alignment thing like it's like if i go play pickup basketball and i'm hyper competitive and mark's just looking to get a run in and i'm wearing him out because I want to win the game. He's like, not, yo, not going to happen. Not it's gonna not going to rest not hey, yeah. <laughs> do, 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 do the players have to answer these questions? No, you cannot ask them, but we said that to our, we say to our users that as more information we're going to have about you, as better match we can provide for you. And uh, for a lot of gamers, it's also very fun because, for example, we measure your player style. We call it gamer DNA model, mm -hmm. but it's basically just different sort of fun that you enjoy inside the game because what we find is it's not enough just to say oh i like i love rpg or something because there's so many different type of rpg or like i love strategy because there's so many of different strategies so why we we go deeper we look uh in different aspect of game is it story is it design is it aesthetic and things like that is a challenge that um, attracts you to some specific game and then we use this information. So for gamers, it's more like, oh, find out what type of gamer I am, or like, what's my gamer DNA, or like, find out what my what is my personality type. And we gamify it. So each person, each character has their own like avatar, and you can read information about other people and their profile. So you go to someone's like profile page, and you can see, oh, this person enjoy this aspect of game the most, or oh, this person has this uh, personality type and then on each personality type we also made videos and we made articles um how to get along with this person based on like his natural biases his natural behavior or like the clashes and conflicts that different personalities can naturally have during the communication and how to overcome them and things like that so just like educate people that not everybody is the same you know, like different people literally think in different way. We have different brains. And uh, again, it makes perfect sense from evolution point of view. Because from evolution point of view, we don't need everybody all in the tribe think the same way. It's very not sustainable. We need to have different opinion. We need to have different way to solve problems to be able to survive. But then as we get over surviving mode, these differences make us uh fight with each other and we think that oh this is the only one way of doing this this person purposely tried to piss me off and like say something to make me mad no <laughs> not necessarily you know yeah. it, it's um it, it's incredible um it's almost like it's you're connecting gamers to other gamers but it's all almost 
the way you describe it, like a, a, a lifestyle and mental health app. It is. Uh, it's actually been uh, research been done by Harvard, and they show that um, human relationship, especially meaningful relationship, like one of the most important factor of predicting how long uh, you your life length going to be. And uh, if you feel lonely, sub like it's subjective. You can feel lonely even if you're surrounded by people or you can feel lonely when you're physically by yourself. It's as bad for you as 15 cigarettes per day. Pretty wow. bad. Very bad. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Um, love it. I, it's the... Is the idea to get this into platforms like Steam, where actually where you actually get your games, where you buy your games, you could go through this, or it, like how 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 does it work at the moment in that in terms of that? Because you've got uh, like have... nearly a, a million users, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, we we getting bigger and bigger with every month, which is I really enjoy to see because we have this big mission and. Uh, it's also better for everyone in the platform because we go so deep into matching, having more people in general make everyone's experience better and help you find people who you will get along with the best. Um, so right now we have our own separate app that go with the integration with like 18 different social networks and you can upload all your uh, friends and all your game list and things like that to have it unified in the platform. The problem with one specific platform that they don't really in, like interconnect it with each other. They kind of have, I got it, it's corporation, they think about money and things like that. But they have these walls that instead of uniting gamers, they kind of separating them to their own small worlds, which is in a way it's sad because it's gaming is bigger than one specific company. You know, it's a it's lifestyle, it's community and a lot of gamers are, you know, in in weird position in life when they actually seeking for connections, they seeking for friends, and they need social support. So that's something that we try to provide them. So is there is there a way? Because I know a lot of gamers communicate, you know, in platforms like you know Discord or right. whatever whatever else is out there. How are you able to actually create? Like, if I was playing a game, if I was playing say call of duty and you know mark was playing i don't know Fortnite, right but i wanted to connect with mark through game stream and be like hey let's hang out and and play together can you do that when you're playing different games yes. or do you have to be talk about how that works yeah so, uh when we match people we don't i usually match around one specific game you can filter by one specific game but majority of players and that's something that we notice if you gamer you usually play more than one game and if you're looking for friends to play something you don't have really i sometimes you just want to play this specific game but very often it's just like i want to find good people to play anything and very often i can go to someone's profile and i see i don't even care what to play i just want to hang out with the good people and that's pretty much reality and uh majority of communication right now move online right now there's statistic that kids and young generation uh, they spend twice as much time talking with people online versus in real life and something that you mentioned about the score is funny enough because when toxicity started skyrocketing in many games like league of legends etc the best thing that they figure out how to prevent toxicity it's n stop it's been like live communication, but they don't really solve anything. They do not allow people to communicate inside the game anymore due to toxicity. But what they did, they just pushed the problem from inside the Somewhere game else, to the yeah. Discord. That's pretty much, but that's not a solution. It's just you taking problem from your shoulder and like throw it away to exist over there. Kind of shrugging away responsibility. You know, right, you know, right, yeah. right. What, so what, so from a from like a parent perspective, because I know we got a you know a lot of a lot of folks that listen in our disruptor and curious mind audience that that are parents and you know parents that you know maybe their kids are playing games or maybe they're getting ready to explore games and in Mark's case, right? What can Game Tree do to kind of help parents or kind of assure parents or or 
Yeah, what's your message yeah, I think there? a lot of parents are, are, are scared or I guess a lot of that stems from ignorance and not knowing what's going on, but I think there is quite a lot of fear. Yeah, I think um, if you if your kid just like gonna jump to game by itself, there is a chance that over time when he faced more and more some, you know, moments, especially if you're new players and um, the environment is not that friendly, you, you kind of get bitter by yourself. Like if you experience this all over around, at some point you're going to be, I don't want to be bullied online anymore. I'm going to be a bully. And then it's just like spreading out this, the whole thing even more and more. So by having um, more curated people that play with each other, that if your kid want to start playing, probably the best that you can do is uh, start playing with him and find real life friends or real people that they could use games for building a better relationship. It used to be physical toys. It used to be, I don't know, Lego or like trains where people was playing with each other. Right now it's all online and that's okay. It's not bad, but just make sure that your kid or even you, if you play a game, um, have very good group of people and like in, engage with each other before game try to engage with each other after game just jumping into randoms group by itself by design gonna be uh very tricky and risky and um that's very simple advices there's probably no way to protect your kid in online uh world because it's just, you know, it's online world. But what you can do is to create fireballs and educate your kid how to react, how to respond, how to seek people better. Um, that, you know, like anonymity is a big part. Um, not, um, yeah, just like awareness can uh, help a lot. Yeah. And I think one of also big problem is that people who create games, they great, they great with like, design ideas challenge etc cetera, etc cetera. but there's very few attention left for actual social aspect for human interaction in some games they naturally created this we against them kind of and when you have this differentiation our team and like versus they team it also can be um seeing as toxic some games are more collaborative and i think that's a good starting point uh, versus uh, games where push you fight with each other. Uh, it's kind of probably better to keep it for later on, you know, later in life. When you're a teenager, when you like want to fight with somebody, go fight. <laughs> go fight with this uh, online game. Great advice. Great advice. Um, what, just one last question for me. I saw that one of the investors was the former CMO of Tinder. And I think a lot of people listening to this will have come to the same conclusion that it's partly a dating app as well. Uh, yeah, in a way, we started from being one of the best matchmaking for gaming industry. And then we understand and we see a lot of demands from user to not just they don't want just to find a person. They want to stay in touch. They want to share the experience. They want to feel this community aspect, feel that they accept it and feel that they part of something bigger than they are. So we start adding more and more social feature and move more to like social platform. But uh, matching algorithm is still one of the best um, way to find us uh, and discover if you want to find gamers, find gamer friends, find people to play with. Game Tree will be your solution, your answer. If you want to start some new games, you don't know anyone who already played that. Going just online is too scary and too unpredictable. Go to Game Tree, find your buddies, chat with them before, asking them to maybe some advice or something to help. And there's going to be definitely a bunch of people who want to help you, who want to start you, who want to, uh, you know, be your mentors and first buddies that you will play any kind of game with. Love it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, this has been a, this has been a fascinating conversation. Um, I, I, I look forward to learning more as we go about game tree and, and maybe even diving in and, and messing around with it a little bit. It, it um, sounds awesome, doesn't it? It really does. It sound does. Like something that we, that the gaming needs. It does. Well, let's, so let's, uh, uh 
let's move to our final question as we attempt to stitch these episodes together in uh, in chaotic yet random ways. What would be your question uh, to leave for our next guest? And it can be about anything. It doesn't have to be about this topic. Whatever is on your mind that you're grinding on, that you're thinking on, what could we pass on to the next? Well, I originally wanted to ask something about technologies, but then I thought that technology is just a part of life and life is so much bigger. And I feel right now a lot of people experience that life is so unpredictable. It, it feels almost all world is going crazy, like tons of conflicts, war, politicians, just absolutely nuts. So I wanted to ask if that would be one wisdom that our next speaker can share with all world what what would it be? Good question. I love it. I love it. Well, well, Dana, thanks so much for joining us. We'll do a nice write up. Uh, send us some links or anything you want us to share with with our network. But this has been a been an awesome conversation. We appreciate you joining. Uh, Mark, yeah. you want to do a little wrap up? Talk about book club. Anything else that we want to throw out there? I do. Yeah, and I just I loved doing this. Thinking on paper is brilliant. We've got we've got some. I want to do something where we connect the gaming episodes because we had Riot Games on here. We had the episode with the Swedish composer about hyper-personalization of music. Reactional music, yep. Reactional music, yeah. We've, uh, have we had any other... I think we've had... Who else have we had on? We had the Sandbox CEO on about metaverse gaming. So, yeah, it, it's, they're all it's threading together nicely. Um, book club. We've also got a book club where we read books together. The original um, technology. Yeah, this one we've read Shane Parrish, Clear Thinking... The design of everyday things, the nexus, technology, technology books, AI books, culture books, thinking books. Yep. Thinking on paper at XYZ. There you go. There you have it. And uh, this show is brought to you by Right to Know You, www.righttoknowyou.com. It's a uh, methodology, a process to understand yourself in the world using writing. Guys, thanks for joining. Be curious, stay disruptive. Keep thinking on paper. Till next Thank time. Bye bye. Bye bye.